Hello, welcome to the uh, LFC Daily Trippers Women's Show. It's me, Chris Brack, and I'm here with Philippa, and I'm here with Neil. Uh, today's show is sponsored by bookmakers.com. All the details will be in the description below. The main uh, bookmakers and uh, betting's not your thing. Don't worry, you don't need to do it. But there is some good stuff on their websites in terms of statistics, if that's what you're into. And they also have their own YouTube channel, which Gav does make an appearance on. How are we all? Not bad. Much better after three points. Yeah, this is the day after the the, uh, the uh, Spurs game. Thank God. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit hoarse, so I've got to be honest. My, vo- my voice is killing me after that. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming at the ref. Uh, yeah, there was a little bit of that. We'll come. We'll come to. We'll come to her. She was uh, entertaining, let's say the least. But <laughs> listen, I think since we last spoke, um, we've uh, played Chelsea in the cup. Um, got got beat three two, but you know Chelsea away is always a, a tough game. And then we've had four league games, and we've probably. I think we were hoping to get four points from Reading and Leicester and then hopefully get something out of Spurs. We got the win out of Spurs, got the win out of Reading, disappointing loss to Leicester, and then the Arsenal game was we kind of knew it was going to be a different game, but especially Philippa with um just look at the Arsenal game. Got seven players out injured, you know, between that and Leicester, which made it a very mixed match side, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean we've also had that break as well, haven't we? You know, mm. we always talk about this where you know, you just seem to have a clump of fixtures together and then, you know, you can go a month without playing a game and that's what happened there. Um, and then, you know, you get players injured as well. So, um, you know, after after the Arsenal game, I was feeling pretty pessimistic because, you know, you, you look at it and you go, you have to then get three points against Spurs because if, if you don't, you know, you're really looking over your shoulder and you're going, where's the next points coming from? Um but thankfully, you know, those three points yesterday, it takes a bit of the pressure off. And, you know, it, it looks like we've kind of managed to edge ourselves away from that uh, relegation scrap, should we say. And, you know, we're we're in the mix with the likes of West Ham as that, that next little group now. So um, it just helps us breathe a little bit easier, I would say. Yeah, Neil, as Philip says, we're, we're probably starting to get a situation now where, where it's more look up rather than look behind us. Not quite, but it's getting close to that. I mean, I think historically, if you take up the year cut short for COVID, the lowest points total to ever stay up is 14, So, which we're, we're already there. So we're kind of sort of we're on par for where we wanted to be to get to, to stay up. I think the key question on the look up or look down thing is just what group West Ham are in. Yeah. Um, I think you can even have a bit of a conversation with that around Everton, not in a sense that Everton are, are, are in any threat of relegation, more just that Everton's sort of underlying numbers over the course of the campaign actually aren't great. You know, they're outperforming uh, massively expected goals for and against so far this season. Uh, but ultimately, they've got the 20 points on the board. They're absolutely fine. And, and I expect Liverpool now to be pretty much fine. It, it needs quite a marked shift. And I would argue Liverpool to lose every single game for them to now end up sort of sucked into it. And, and hopefully that won't happen. I think it's important, though, just to be realistic about what this season is, was, and I think arguably does continue to be. This is a Liverpool team that haven't won an away game. They haven't won one yeah. away game. And it's worth, you know... I, Whilst I agree that Liverpool, you know, it's such a big win against Tottenham and I was absolutely raucously delighted when the final whistle went because of how significant that win is. But as part of this year, you know, it really is. It's it's more than three points. It is you know, the idea that there's now a five-point gap, two Tottenham, same number of games played. And the idea that there is, by extension, a seven-point gap now all the way back to Leicester, um, uh, same number of games played. Um, and the fact that Brighton, look wobbly and Liverpool look better than Reading, all is great. But whilst you can do a little bit of looking up and wondering, can we get past West Ham United? The ultimate truth is Liverpool are in that bottom chunk of teams. So the aim now is to finish the top of that bottom chunk of teams, but Liverpool are in that bottom chunk of teams. There's certain things they need to do between now and the end of the season, I'd argue, to to state that they're not. Um, I think winning away game is one of them. I think, and they have a bit of hard lines against Tottenham because I feel a little bit like if Liverpool had got in half time 3 1, like I would argue they deserve to do, then they possibly go on and win that game even more comfortably than 3 1. I think hmm. Liverpool are understandably nervous as the second half wears on, and Tottenham are understandably sort of front footed, even if they're not quite as good as Liverpool. They feel as though there could be something in it for them. But I think it's important to have that sort of humility that that's where, that's where this side is uh, currently. There's, you know, it's going to take. It's going to take a couple more changes 
in terms of both personnel and I would argue at times possibly approach from what we've seen since we've last had a conversation for us to no longer sort of be in that category. That's currently the category where we are. Um, and then the question is whether or not we end up with West Ham being in our category or whether or not West Ham managed to demonstrate, uh, which I don't think they've done so far this season, but they belong in the category above. Cool. Phil, but be honest though, once you put up eight minutes at a time, I, I, the last time I yelped when I seen that at the time, I think it was Chelsea 05, Liverpool. I, I generally, I think I had to, have a, had to have a little lie down when I saw that, to be honest. Can't deny it. Yeah, I mean, I was expecting it to be quite lengthy, but I was thinking maybe six minutes. So when it turned out to be eight, I was just like, you've, you've almost got to account for 10 minutes because, hmm. you know, there's good, when you've got such a long period of time as your, as your injury time, so to speak, something's going to happen within those eight minutes as well that's going to add on a little bit more time as well. So, um, yeah, I I have to say I, I was uh, anxious when that got put up. But, I mean, to be fair to, to Liverpool, you know, there wasn't any any period where I would say that we really looked like we were going to concede a goal um, within yeah. that eight minutes. And I think that is really important to say. Um, and I think Matt was right after the match where he said, you know, he felt that we were in control both when we had the ball and when we didn't have the ball, we 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 played the game I think that we wanted to play, and I don't think it suited Tottenham the game that we did play, um, which you know is really good and it shows that we learned from when we played at their place earlier on in the season, and you know could have arguably been three or four goals down in that first half in the in the reverse fixture, um, and there was none of that yesterday. Um, there was no panic either when we went one goal down, which you know was really good to see as well. Um, you know, because it, it would have been very easy for the heads to go a little bit, having been so so on top in the game and not get the goal and then Spurs get something a little bit out of nothing there. Um, so, yeah, I think overall yesterday, you know, it was a it was a great performance and, you know, it showed it showed how much it meant to the players as well. You know, the way they celebrated when that final whistle went as well. Um, you know, they know how important that was. Just on 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 the amount of added time, I would argue it's one of the few things the referee got right uh, <laughs> over the course of the game because it was you know it was a really yeah. really broken up second half. Uh, there was players dropping on both sides with injuries, head injuries, um, so on and so forth. I think a couple of the Liverpool ones were maybe a teeny bit exaggerated, uh, which is fine. Liverpool were trying to break the rhythm. Uh, of yeah. Tottenham up insofar as they had any rhythm. There was tons and tons of good gamesmanship and professionalism on show from Liverpool. Uh, I thought all the way through the game, but especially in that second half, you know, led by Rachel Laws in that regard. But I think just sort of full stop, understanding precisely what was on the line from a Liverpool point of view was good. So I wasn't surprised by the eight minutes and nor was I sort of massively concerned by it. Now, listen, you know, there is a, a, a relatively tidy opportunity in there. So, you know, you've got to bear that in mind. Uh, Kick yeah. Graham does get somewhere close to it, but then Stengel arguably should go up the other end and score anyway um you know i think it's i think it's going to be a i think that across sort of the way in which this stuff works liverpool i think see the game out pretty well i'll say the same thing again that i said sort of before you know i think that ultimately i think if liverpool had beaten leicester in the same way that I think if Liverpool go 3-1 up in the first half, they win the game more comfortably in the second. I feel if Liverpool have beaten Leicester and genuinely did feel there was a significant cushion between them and Tottenham, the more able to play more comfortable, expansive football in the second mm -hmm. half and probably pick Tottenham off uh, because I do think that Liverpool are a better side than Tottenham in this moment. I, I thought you got to see that first half by some distance. I was surprised by how limited Tottenham were uh, in a few regards. And I think that the other thing around the injury time as well was I didn't know. I think a lot of what they were doing was uh, verged verged on the, not just not way beyond physical. Uh, I think there's, there was a number of the Tottenham players where, you know, as far as I was concerned, the referee, the referee's reluctance to get the yellow card out was was a problem that, that Liverpool was suffering from because Tottenham, I think, felt they could, they could almost do what they want with impunity um, for, for a lot of that game. And Liverpool stand really firm in the face of that. I'm... You know, it's it's a great win in the circumstances, and part of why it is a great win, and part of why I'm almost reluctant to look up is that, you know, to 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 enjoy and relish the win for what it is, you've got to acknowledge what the season's been to now, and that's why it was great. You know, it was brilliant, and it was brilliant that they hung on, and it was the, the brilliant the togetherness that was shown because they are on the verge of sort of complete mission one. Um, it's now obviously then about sort of framing mission two, but it was a great three points, and I thought that it was epitomised 
not by Rachel Laws and not even by Gemma Bonner, but by Katie Stengel, who mm. puts in a sort of 90 minute performance. A centre forward very rarely has to put in. And what I mean by that is, in most, le- at all levels of football, um, both both genders, there is a thing that ultimately happens when a centre forward plays that sort of game, which is that they come off on 65 and there's another one to replace them to do the same yeah. thing. And maybe not do it as well, or maybe do it a little bit differently. But Liverpool didn't have that luxury, and Stengel goes into every sprint knowing she's not getting subbed. She puts a body on the line every single time knowing she's not getting subbed. Um, she goes for every header landing knowing she's not getting subbed. This is there is not the luxury of a substitution for Katie Stengel, and she played every. And I think you saw a really tired second half in terms of being able to look after the ball a little yeah. bit better. But it's she was still put a body where it needed to be. It was a phenomenal performance. It really, really was. I mean, we've seen that all season from Philippe. I mean, the physical demand she she undertakes is unreal, both fair and unfair. And we'll come on to some of the situations we've seen during the season, but some of the, I promise, the hits she has to take and still keeps getting up, you know, it takes some doing, to be honest, because, um, and you could say, look, we saw her after the game, I saw her after the game, she looked absolutely broken. And I mean, like, you know, just like limping off. I'm, like, I'm not surprised she'd been kicked in the air so many times and just, Gets up, she, goes again, and goes it, again. Yeah. You know, it's. I'm not. Look, all, we're all. They're all pressed footballers, but not all pressed footballers fancy that after a while. Cause no one does after a while. No one fancy getting kicked up in the air all the time. <laughs> You're like, I've had, enough, I've had enough of this. But in this four, one of four games, what we've also seen is, I think we've seen a few fringe players as well as some of the established players sort of step up. I mean, Leanne Robe has barely been seen outside of cup games this season. She was brilliant yesterday. You know, yeah. Pro- probably could do a little bit with a goal. I think she gets turned. A, a bit e- easily, but other than that, defensively no problem. Long range passing. Her and Bonner had a, had a nice understanding. Yana Daniels again comes in this time. She's a centre forward. She's been full back. She's been she plays everywhere, you know. And Missy Bow has stepped up nicely. You know she's done. You know, given a little bit of a freer role. And I think that's actually that's now seeing the goals of Missy Bow because she's get, we're getting her in positions where you want Missy Bow to be and where she can do her best work and her, her, the damage to other teams. Yeah, I think um, maybe maybe it's down to the injuries that we've had up front. Uh, we've kind of fallen into a into a formation, I think, which really suits Missy Bow. Um, mm. You know, I think we first saw it actually at City away, um, where yeah. she kind of played that more forward, advanced midfield role, um, and it's where you know she thrives for me. Um, I don't think she's as um, tactically aware as some of the other midfielders when it comes to playing that little bit deeper so I think you know giving her that little bit of freedom to express herself and to to do what she does so well um you know is is much much better for her um and like I say you know the the, the goal again yesterday um you know I think both goals were slightly fortuitous if we're being honest um you know could have the second one could have easily been ruled out um you know, but we we get given the benefit of the doubt on it. But you know, Missy Bow actually getting into those positions because she's playing that little bit further forward. She just, you know, gives us that little bit of an extra option, especially with not having um, as many forwards available at the moment. Um, I mean, there's arguments, isn't there, about whether or not some of these players will be here next season? You know, Leanne Robe, I think, a contracts up in the summer. Um, but one thing you can always say about her is she, she, you know, she gives her heart and soul when she's on the pitch, and she did that again yesterday. You know, the block, you know, towards the end of the game and um, to prevent a goal, I think was was huge for us. Um, and you know, that's what you want. You want even like your, um, you know, your squad players to be able to come in and to contribute. And I think you know, there's there's nothing that you can say about any of these players that you can go, they're not contributing in some way, shape, or form. Um, to, be, this... to be fair to Liam Rowe, the number nine for Tottenham, I cannot pronounce her surname. She clearly targeted Liam because she's about a foot tall of her. I mean, she's about a foot tall of most players, but she's, you know, I thought she held up to her physical dominance so well because she just decided, I'm going to be a rash. So you, you may beat me early, but I'm going to be a rash. You can't turn, you can't get away. And I thought she cottoned onto that really quickly. You know, think... which is something you know an experienced player will do. You know, and I thought she did well because you did. That was a worry for me when you looked. I think well, she's not going to pull onto Bonner. She's going to pull onto the shorter centre back. I thought she handled that really well. Yeah, I think sometimes it's just about being in players' faces and not giving them a second on the ball. Um, 
you know, and I, I thought all across the pitch yesterday, we did, we did that pretty well. You know, we didn't give them time to to look up and find spaces, and um, you know, that's something that I would level. You know, a bit of a disappointing thing maybe from the Arsenal game was it? It was almost like we were allowing them the freedom of the park. It was almost like we're going. We know that you're better than us, and kind of sitting off them a little bit. And there was there was so much space for them to exploit between midfield and defence. It was uh, it was frightening. Um, but then they obviously looked at that, addressed it, and then you know for the Tottenham game it was a lot more compact and um, like I say, not giving Spurs that opportunity to to pick the passes and and the space that they wanted to, um, and it you know it worked. It got us the three points. Neil, let's talk about Fuka Nagano because quite frankly, it's just brilliant to watch her. She's absolutely immense. But I also think what she gives us tactically is it allows Kerry Holland to press higher. And I think we saw the benefit of that against against Tottenham, and we saw it against Reading as well. But because Kerry now has that cover behind her that Fuka gives, it gets the best out of both of them. But I mean, I'll openly admit it: for the second goal, I was screaming "shoot" to her and didn't see the pass that she saw. And went, "That's why I sat. That's why I sit the stands." And she is what she is because it was ridiculously brilliant play by her again. Yeah, I think she's. I think. I think. You know, Liverpool have still got a couple of questions to answer around her uh, in terms of what it is they're going to want her to do over the longer term tactically. Because you do sort of worry that there's, you know, there's a, there is a physicality element, there's a covering the ground element. I think she, what she does brilliantly is she anticipates. So in a defensive, set, she, in, I mean, in every single sense, she reads the game so brilliantly, both going forward and going the other way. But she really has to be on a metal to anticipate to cover the ground because a lot of the time she's sort of left on her own in there to a degree. Uh, and, you know, she, therefore she's obviously got to, get, got, got to find herself in the right place. And then as part of that, I think in the early stages of the game, you know, I think Liverpool dominate the first sort of five to ten. Um, when Tottenham begin to find ways out, the finding ways out actually playing through the middle of Liverpool and not round the sides of them. And that's because Fuka's in there on her own as this sort of stands tactically. And the sooner I think, you know, Liverpool will go on and talk about it maybe to an extent around sort of next season bits and pieces. But the sooner Liverpool can play a three in there where I'd argue there's a clear sort of deep lying player. And then Fuka's there to support him both, but going both ways. I think that's when we'll see the very, very best out of her. I think she's a joy to watch uh, every single time I've seen her. I think she's a joy to watch. I think there is a problem, which is that sides are very well aware of how much Liverpool want to play through her. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we see actually in the Leicester game is she becomes so much more influential when Liverpool actually sh- sh- shift themselves to a back four from a back three. And she's able to get on it much more in the middle of the pitch and Leicester can't do a thing where they've almost got a front and behind. They're almost trying to sort of, she, it's not like a complete sort of man marking situation, but it is that, that we'll, we, we block the ball in in one direction and if she picks it up, we block the first lane in the other direction. And I think that's what Leicester did to her really quite effectively, quite wisely. And then as I say, when Liverpool change it, it becomes little bit different and that's why listen Liverpool win the game yesterday 2-1 and also the attacking sort of demonstration of the first half means that this wouldn't have been right so I I want to be clear about this but I think Liverpool next season against certain sides um, maybe home and away having a bit of a plan that's less 5-2-3 or less 5-3-2 and a little bit more back four uh, from a start and sort of position I think that's when you'll see the best out of Nagano because she is a joy to watch Um, she thought she was excellent yesterday um I think she'll be in, you know, I, I, I think one of Liverpool's problems will be how long have they got her contracted for? Because you can already see immediately how she could add something to a top four, top six team in this league. And Liverpool are going to have to be conscious of that because, you know, I think that she is the sort of player who Liverpool can keep hold of for two seasons or so. You can build yourself into a top four, a top six side with the amount of quality that she has paired with the fact that the other player Liverpool, I think, have got to do everything in their power to keep hold of, as you just said, is Kerry Holland. Um, I think those two, with the right support around them, and then really, really good squad options, can see Liverpool have a midfield that can compete with, if not necessarily the top two or three in the division, but maybe those fourth, fifth, sixth, uh, and so on. And I think that's that, that's the direction of travel and Liverpool is showing it, but you've got to keep it moving that mm-hmm. way. And I think if they can, then it's, you know, it is an exciting prospect. And the other thing to point out about both Nagano and Holland is that they're both 24, 25. You know, these are women who are going to continue to A, improve as players, but who've got five years minimum at this level left. And, uh, and what I mean by this level is is good enough to be able to play regular games for a, for a top side, not just the idea of a side that's fighting against relegation. 
very much so. We'll come back to Liverpool in a minute. I, was, I thought we'd have a bit of a talk about WSL going forward and you know the growth of women's football. Um, because so, there's still elements of women's football that I think we talked about in the last show. Fixture can fixtures we talked about it again. The planning of them we we can go into. We are going to talk about about the officials. The the standard of officiating, I think, is harming the product. It's getting to that point now. It's harming the product, but also, I think it's going to result in harming players because there are some tackles in plenty of WSL games, non Liverpool, that you're looking thinking they shouldn't be allowed to be happening. And I do wonder now. It's almost like the game has progressed professionally, but I don't feel like other areas of the infrastructure is getting there or getting there quick enough. So yeah. So, so how do you feel about that, Philba? Yeah, I think you're right. I think, um, I mean, particularly on the refereeing side of things, um, I think it's okay for you know for the game to be physical. You know, we don't, you know, we don't want it to be a non-contact sport. But there were certain tackles yesterday, for example, that for me crossed a line, um, and they should be punished accordingly. You know, there should be yellow cards dished out, and then that player doesn't do it a second time and a third time. Whereas what happened yesterday was there was players that, that did it continuously throughout the game because they hadn't been punished. Um, you know, we only have to go back to the very first game of the season against Chelsea when uh, Leanne Kiernan gets wiped out by a tackle and she's she's basically going to miss the whole of the season because of that one tackle that didn't get punished. Um, you know, it is something that needs to be looked at. Um I mean, I have a little bit of sympathy for the officials because they haven't been professional, I don't think, until this season. Um, mm. You know, that needs to come in. There needs to be that standard that comes up. But what I would say and what I find very disappointing is you've got, you basically got Premier League referees, then you've got the Championship, then you've got the rest of men's football, including non-league football, and then it's the women's officials. Mm. And for me, if you're being honest about like where you want this game to go and you know the fact that you want it to be the pinnacle of of the women's game you have to treat it accordingly across the board um you know i've spoke before about you know the investment in the fa cup you know the the um the winning money for for you know the fa cup and you know there was a big thing made of how they'd they'd close the gap on like the men's prize fund and then you find out actually when the season comes around that they've increased the men's prize fund by even more than what they've done in the women's and you know everything that they do seems to go against what they say they're trying to do um and i, I just don't think it's good enough um you know, I was he, me and Neil was having a conversation yesterday about the fact that, you know, the, the the games that are on the TV as well, it's always the same teams that are on TV. Mm. You know, it's your Chelsea, it's your Arsenal, it's your Man United, Man City. Those four teams are always on. Yet there's other games that are also interesting to watch. Um, you know, there's one on on Wednesday night. You know, Spurs Leicester. It's an absolutely huge game. That why why aren't we able to to see it on on either Sky or on BBC? You know, there's more to the women's game than just four teams. Um, and it's, it seems to be, you know, whether or not when Liverpool get up there, you know, we might be one of those, but I don't think it's fair on the other teams in the league that basically they only get to to showcase their their game when they're playing against one of the top four sides, when it's more than likely that they're going to get, you know, beat in those games. It's, you know, there needs to be a little bit more thought, I think, going into, you know, what they what they want to show um and if it's just to to highlight the best sides in in the league then you know the others are never going to catch up for me um and the same goes for you know um the fact that like the likes of Chelsea can basically monopolize the you know the best players in the league somebody you know stands out and they they, they go out and they get them and you know you have to question whether or not you know that should that should be okay if we really want to develop the women's game or do we just want one team or two teams or three teams to just dominate all the time? Um, you know, I know we can label that other leagues as well, but, you know, I, I think it's something that we really need to look at if, you know, if we want to develop the women's game as a whole. Yeah, I mean, is one way to do that is is that bringing in what well, they have the men's game, like a, you know, a squad, a certain number of squad play, a certain squad size that you have to have? Is that one uh, way of doing it? I mean, they do have that. Um, it's smaller than in the men's game. Um, I just, 
I mean, even like the fixtures side of things, you know, every everything for me needs looking at. And, mm. you know, I would argue that the best way to develop the women's game would actually be to increase the number of teams that are in the WSL. You know, if you had 16 teams in there, uh, you wouldn't end up with, you know, teams only winning two or three games in a season. You know, they, they would have more opportunities than that with the more teams that are in there. And therefore, they, they would be able to attract more more of the top players as well. Um, and therefore, for me, you would you would close that gap a little bit between those top sides. Um, you know, it's 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 a shame for me really that the top sides, the only the only games that they look like they're gonna drop points is is against the other so- top seeds, you know, uh, so- top sides, sorry. Um I know that we beat Chelsea first game of the season, but you know, that was you know a standout result. You know, you don't get that normally, you know, in the WSL. Um, and I don't think we've seen it throughout the whole rest of the season. You know, teams are going up to those places and, you know, they're, they're trying not to get beat by too many goals. And, you know, we we need to try and develop the women's game so that that's not the case. I think the, the I think there's just so many questions that I think it's good that, I mean, we're having this conversation and there is the, the Karen Car- the Karen Carney review is, is ongoing. Now, precisely who's contributing to that and, and, and what the end product of that's likely to be and in whose interest it is, because its terms of reference are, you know, quite interesting. Just to be really clear, the review was launched in 2022, September. Uh, it's got a particular focus on one, assessing the potential audience reach and growth of the game, considering the value and visibility of women's and girls' football in England, including the potential to grow the fan base for women's football and whether current growth can be achieved without overstretching infrastructure. Number two is the financial health of the game and its financial sustainability uh, for the long term, exploring opportunities to uh, and ways to support the commercialisation of the women's game, broadcast revenue opportunities and sponsorship. And the three structures within women's football, including affiliation with men's teams, prize money and the need for women to adhere to administrative requirements of the men's game, uh, assessing adequacy, quality, accessibility and prevalence of facilities. That's what's at stake within that review. That is... That leaves a lot of room for interpretation, but one of the things that I think the key aspects of it is, for me, the language of it, where it focuses on growth, visibility, commercialization, sponsorship, is that it goes, It my worry becomes it ends up following a similar-ish pattern to the way in which the men's game is sort of aggressively tried to be grown at all costs. And, you know, when, for instance, I'm lucky enough to speak to Maggie Murphy um, at, at Lewis, and the way in which she speaks about it is that the game, you know, it doesn't have to follow that path. It can follow a path that's much more, um, much more collectively interesting. But that is the path that has been followed to a certain extent so far. Look at the teams that sit at the top of the WSL, Chelsea, Arsenal, Manchester City, Manchester United. We're sitting here, let's be clear about this, you know, we want Liverpool. I'm, I'm sure if you gave me and Philip at the flick of a switch to have Liverpool double the budget that they're putting into women's football, we would actually double the budget. And I would argue with the people who for instance make financial based decisions at Liverpool that's smart money that you're investing to recoup in the longer term as the game grows and expands and part of what I think we've all hoped for from this season is Liverpool stay up and then they look to really increase and grow and show the value of it over a period of time so one of the things that's difficult in this if you're not careful you're trying to sort of talk about it as though you're a commentator on it but simultaneously in a couple of senses we're almost participants we've got mm. what we see as our wants and needs and in that framework but ultimately they're not the same wants and needs as maggie's are at lewis maggie's got a position which is much more about sort of the the sustainability of the game and also the idea of the co- collective nature of the game within women's football and it's one that i i genuinely sort of instinctively am drawn towards but simultaneously i want to watch liverpool win the european cup so yeah. you're yeah, you've got to, you know, we've got to bear all of that in mind within these conversations. The refereeing points, I think, is a really valid one, but it will take a little bit of time. I think the the the, the pitch based provision point is a really really valid one. The league point, I instinctively agree with Philippa, but the flip side of that is that Barcelona have won every game this season. They won every game last season, and the last time they lost a game was the season before that. Uh, that was the last time they failed to win a game. Uh, they've won every game in their league, and their league was an 18-team league, and it's now a 16-team league. I feel as though there's an issue with 12, where I do think it is too few, and it's hard to do sort of an Anfield wrap and a day tripper style job because your momentum's constantly broken up with these elongated mm. gaps. The flip side of that, though, is that a writer like Susie Rack argues that women's that a number of women's players are playing too many games 
once the international commitments come in. And it is worth pointing out the spate of a certain type of injuries. It isn't just ACLs, but they're the ones that are getting the most attention. My point about all of this is I think there's a lot of pressure on, on what it is that Karen's doing. Because I think that there's a lot to take in and have sort of a, a, a really clear a really clear sort of outlook at once all the calls for evidence come in. And my worry about the nature of the calls to evidence is they'll end up going to people who are, in inverted commas, currently in authority, in authoritative positions, for whom a perpetuation or extension even of the status quo is what they want. I feel as though this is, you know, I'm happy to to ponder. You know, I think that you can, for instance, make a really strong argument that the women's structure would actually be well served by a European Super League model, um, which goes mm -hmm. against lots of aspects of where we sort of see the men's game at the moment, but it would not necessarily be a negative in the same way around the women's game. Um, as an example, that's not to say I'm making an argument for that and like, this is what Neil Atkinson believes, mm -hmm. but you could make a well-resourced, well-argued one that, that, you know, that you could quite easily do a number of divisions with promotion and relegation for instance around that and that might be really really good to showcase the women's game at its very best and and do something around that given the way in which that where the resources currently are sort of allocated as long as there was a genuine sort of share uh, of those for sides that for instance are in the women's championship and on we go uh, and so on and so forth and then you've got the idea that there's still a number of clubs big clubs who've got women's teams that are beneath the championship and they're all looking to invest to get into the championship and then go from there i i feel as though a lot of this is going to be about there's a fine I, I the flip side at the minute at times when i argue about stuff to do with the men's one of the problems the women's game has is there is a finite number of good footballers for the money that exists within the game that you can attract into the division. So we're talking at the minute about Fuka Nagano was a really good example. She could play for a top six side. And my God, with the greatest of respect to every single one of her teammates this season, many of whom have given everything they can for the cause of Liverpool. But my God, you can see the difference. Yeah. She may well go to... And this is where Philippa's point is, if she was to go to Chelsea, she might play 33% of the games from the start. Yeah. So yes. it does there need to be a a short term be whilst more and more young women are being developed can see a career in football have got better coaching and better facilities to grow and improve as players do we actually need a period of time where we're trying to find a way to artificially ensure that the main resource which is quality footballers is spread out a little bit more and it's not being sort of farmed at the top of the WSL or do we want those teams who have got that at the top of the WSL to be played other sides across Europe more often so we get a showcase of the game at the very highest level in women's football but we accept that therefore what that means is that as you move down that ladder you're going to see that for instance there's a massive difference between the average level of a player playing for Tottenham and the average level of a player playing for Arsenal I, I, I mean I've also had the conversation with Neil about whether or not we should you know bring in almost like a draft system so that you can share out the, the talent the across the size yeah um, you know there's no reason why it has to follow the same way that the men's game's gone you know I know it's traditional and like like Neil says, you know, we all want our own team to be dominant. We all want our own team to be winning every single trophy that there is to win. But it doesn't help with the growth of the game. Now, if every team feels like they've got an opportunity because a draft system, for example, would kind of negate a lot of the inconsistencies, you know, like the, likes, the fact that Chelsea's t uh, squad, basically every single player would get into Liverpool's first 11 there's there's mm. no question about that in my in my opinion whereas if you're spreading that talent across all the sides in the wsl you know each team for me would have almost an equal opportunity to be able to to compete at the at the top of the, at the top of the league and it would make it a lot more entertaining i think for football fans in general and maybe you know, more people would be interested in going to watching the games. I know, I know that's already on a trajectory that's going up, um, but there's a lot of times where you think we've got no chance of getting any points in this game. You know, whereas, you know, just looking at things a little bit differently to you know the norm as to how we expect things to be done, and then you know teams like the likes of Lewis, you know, they could compete with those sorts of sides. You know. The, the the work that Lewis do that you know the community led uh, football club that it is is you know should be a standing light in you know within the the, the actual game as it is um, and instead nobody really talks about it because 
for me, the FA basically want our top sides to be able to go and win win the uh, Champions League, and that's that's what their aim is. So they're quite happy for me, for the likes of Arsenal and Chelsea to have all the best players, and therefore have this opportunity to win the, you know, win the Champions League. But it does take away that competitive element from from the WSL. Yeah, just to contextualise this for listeners, yeah. there is actually an account, uh, a Twitter account, and please don't add them in any way, shape or form or engage with them. Uh, but there is a, a Twitter account called Chelsea Women Loan Army, which is about the six players that Chelsea Women have currently got out on loan. We've had one of them, Charlotte Wardlaw, at times, but there's got the, she's now at Lewis. There's another there's another woman at Lewis. Uh, Aggie Beaver-Jones is at Everton, and she's getting some really solid time on the pitch over the course of the season, and she's impressing. But the point about this is that she's being developed on Everton's time getting games on Everton's time to go back and at some point to be ready for Chelsea's first team. That's it. Now, that's yeah. happened in football for, you know, forever. It's mm. it's It's been a part of the way in which the game's worked. But first and foremost, we get to choose whether or not we want that around the women's game or someone gets to choose that probably shouldn't be um, a, a fellow who hosts a podcast uh, out of, out of <laughs> Liverpool. But people get to choose whether or not they want that. And I would hope, you know, that people would sort of say that they don't necessarily want that. But the idea that there are sort of six women on Chelsea's books who are very much have been sent out to progress elsewhere, who are getting games elsewhere, you know, they could be getting careers elsewhere. And this is this is part of an ongoing process. I suspect next season, to use Aggie as an example, she will be back. Uh, in Chelsea's fold and getting getting some minutes, you know she's got she's got sort of seven nineties worth so far in the league uh, at Everton. I think she's missed a couple of games through injury earlier in the campaign, but she's being prepared for a for a career in the Chelsea first team. Now, if you've got one of them, we get to go fine. But the idea that there's five or six is where you begin to go. Well, are we actually talking here about the farm and a talent in a way that we don't want? And then you look at who is or isn't getting games for Chelsea in the league over the course of the season. And the, the sort of the depth of talent that they've got is is frankly immense. Um, and but the flip side of that is that you know they're obviously footballers who can't who can't be playing anywhere else. And I I think that there does need to sort of be a, a look at that. But that's not the only thing that there needs to be a look at. I think there's so much still to do. I don't envy the people who are sort of trying to work out a pathway. Um, and I think that bold shouts like, for instance, the draft system sound intriguing to me but i think we'd have to understand precisely what we actually think that that equals um mm. in a in a practical way like for instance is there an argument that the league purchases for instance you know 24 players uh over the course of over the course of uh, you know in a summer from from abroad or from elsewhere that the league sort of ends up with 24 players that they're prepared to gift who precisely looks after that what that process is, how it operates, so on and so forth, is so alien to English football nature that I feel as though it would be so fraught with just the idea of everyone going, I don't understand what the fucking hell's going on, which is which is something that English football loves to do. But mm. you know, I think that, you know, for instance, who 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 is responsible for those transfers in the first place? So they're available for a draft. What age process profile are we looking at? You know, we can't be taking players back from the clubs existingly, surely. But I think that but all of that said, I feel as though that, that sounds like I'm pouring scorn on it. I'm not. I'm just merely saying that a lot of this stuff is so, such fresh territory that it takes a lot of getting your mind into in the first place. And the idea of coherently arguing for it, I think, sort of becomes very, very difficult indeed. And I don't think we're that far away from the, there being a lot of things argued for. For instance, I think Emma Hayes made a bit of an argument for a closed league for a couple of seasons recently. And that feels intuitively against the way in which we, we view we view English football. Mm. But she made it she made she made a good argument. It's not what I agree with in the slightest, but she made a good argument. I think there'll be a lot of people who've got so many disparate arguments coming in from so many different angles that I think I think it'll be a it's a complex process to sort of or not coherently because what you can't have is you can't choose and commit to a path over here but do something that's a little bit over here but where it bumps into it it's it's almost like two different paths i think you've got to have an overall sort of sense and a guidance sense and a guidance set of principles and my worry with that review is that those principles that that are in place in the first place for the review are very much around commercialization and growth rather than around the idea of growth measured through money rather than the idea of growth being measured through participation or inclusion yeah i mean going on to the growth point neil and philip at the um if, if we are going to go down the growth route, which is obviously where we want women's football to go, 
it's the knock-on effect of the one benefit, one one perk of women's football at the moment is fan access. So fan, it's it's a big thing at the end of every game. You meet, you know, young players, young young fans get to meet the players, have a photo, have an autograph. Which, let's be honest, as the game's developing, that's going to go. And it's well, it's been a big selling point of the women's game. Well, so at some point that would will go because if you're getting crowds twenty thousand people, you can't have twenty thousand people wait for an autograph. It's just not it's not feasible. So it's how you sort of bed into eventually get to that point where it's it's got to be more you know, appearance based or you know players are playing you know th- that way around it and how sort of media wise we sort of deal with that. Go on, Neil, you look like you was about to say something. <laughs> no, I was pointing at you. Uh, you're there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go yeah. first? I mean, from my side, I mean, we've already seen it from from some clubs where they've stopped basically allowing um, fans access to the players um, because they say that there's too many there now. Um, You know, when we were at Anfield, you know, that didn't happen. Um, I don't think it necessarily spoiled anybody's enjoyment of... I mean, the the scoreline spoiled our enjoyment of the game, but I don't think think that did. Um, you know, but nobody expected it in the men's game. You know, so why, you know, why why do we expect it? Is is I think what I'm trying to say. You know, if we've got like four, five, six thousand people there, it's obvious that not everybody's going to get access to the players anyway. Um, you know, you've you've experienced it yourself this season, Chris, where basically it's like the players are being guided, you know, to one side of the ground and not yeah, the yeah. other. Um. You know, and you can say whether or not that's fair or it isn't fair. Um, but, you know, I think we are going to come to a point where, you know, that maybe isn't part of it. Maybe, you know, it, it has to be outside of the ground after the game. People have to queue or, you know, come up with a different solution to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, it's, but it's I mean, more of, it's, I think it's something, it's something they probably need to plan for at some point. Because at some point, it's, yeah. it's, I just don't think it's practical. But I, think, um, but I think when, you, I, when you're thinking about inclusion, Chris, I think for me the key question here is, you know, I would much rather, for instance, there's more money in the game and girls and women, frankly, because I think a lot of the times when we do the grassroots conversation, we always forget the fact that, you know, firstly, there's there's, there's entire cohorts of women who are never given the opportunity to play football. They might not, might hmm. not want to take the game up at the age of 43 or whatever. Uh, but and, and that's, at me. Yeah, well, no, that's, <laughs> but that's as valid. That is as valid as the idea of a six-year-old. Yeah, yeah. That we, yeah. We, can't, we can't get lost in that, really, when we talk about grassroots. But what we're talking about with grassroots is we're talking about the idea of people being able to play the game at a level that suits them and get the opportunity to do so. And that's hugely valuable and that's more inclusive and that's about inclusion mm-hmm. as well. And then we're also talking about people being able to to go and enjoy the games and enjoy a standard of football in, in terms of the professionalised offering, which is what we at least, I would argue, want the top two flights to be. You know, So I think that I understand why there's an emotional within the game reaction to the idea of, of what's effectively a meet and greet. But there's lots of ways in which meet and greets are done and not, by the way, necessarily commercialised, which is one of the things that would come through if you begin to have this conversation. You know, there may well be the opportunity to post-match. You know, the women will sit outside in, a, in, in stalls sort of arrangements outside the stadium you can come and have a chat and they can get pictures taken there which is that people need to hang on and not just do it by the side of the pitch where people might feel as though it's unsafe because it'll lead to everyone rushing down post-match yeah, yeah. but instead there's a queuing system in place where for instance each team afterwards puts up eight women who played they sit separately you can go to any one of them you can't go to all 16 or all eight of your team but you can queue up for the one that you want in a more sort of structured way and then you get to post for pictures and someone says hello and all of that happens and what we'd like to think from our women football that we know so far, they'd be queuing up for the opportunity to do that post-match and they'd see it as part of the, the role and the function of, of all the thing. And whilst it wouldn't have the same sort of immediate post-match reaction that the, you know, it is good the way in which they come to the side of the pitch and it does offer a sense of uh, collectiveness, but obviously that's different. Let's be clear about this. One of the reasons why that works at Prenton is because there's only one stand open. Correct, you know, yeah. I've, I've been at men's games where that's happened overseas and everyone doesn't quite know where to go. Like, do you want the players to do a full lap of honour? The players don't entirely feel like doing a full lap of honour, if we're all honest, because whether they've won or lost, they've just had 90, you know, if it's anything like Tottenham versus Liverpool, they've just had 90 minutes having the shit kicked out of them. They want to get out <laughs> down the tunnel, um, but they do this bit. But if they've got to go, hang on, I've got to go to that corner and that corner, and I've got to go over there because we've sold Prenton Park out, and we surely want to sell Prenton Park out. Let's be clear, we want to sell Anfield out. So, you know, you've got to therefore think, well, what are the wants and needs here? 
And we want to sell Anfield out again, not for the money, but we want to sell Anfield out because we want the idea that there's 60,000 people in the city who want to watch women play a game of football and enjoy every minute of it. And so I think, I just think that there's there's bits and pieces where some of what's been, in inverted commas, there'll be other ways to do it and it may well mm-hmm. need to take a little bit of a backward step. But again, you know, everyone's got a sort of be not entirely on the same page. For instance, what Lewis's answer is doesn't need to be the same as what Manchester United's answer is. But I do think there does mm. need to be sort of collective feelings that this is this is this is where and what we want things to be in amongst all of that. And I do think that that is a little bit complicated. And I think we've got to work out what we do or don't want to get hung up on. For me, I want the game to be genuine the inclusive and I wanted to grab the attention of the nation in the same way that the men's game does you know that's that that's the direction of travel that I'd like to see first and foremost but I think the better way to do that is to in lots of ways look at what the men's game actually gets wrong find alternative ways to do it and keep a lot of the core values around a genuine feeling of inclusivity and a genuine feeling of almost underdog spirit within there as well keep all of that together keep that sense of togetherness together throughout the whole game and see if there's something there that you can build on. Yeah, makes sense. I think my point was more, more of it's it's at the moment it's a big advertising point of the women's game, which it, which will evolve for that. But I was just thinking it's something that it needs to be thought out. What we don't want is like the immediate cut off, right? We don't do that anymore. Yeah. Which I think is what probably happened in the men's game, and I think that's where I think that cr- then creates a bit more of a an us and them, if mm. you know what I mean. Whereas actually there, there is a feeling of bit more connection with players because you feel they're accessible not totally but you feel there's a bit more of a of a link a link with them which probably goes on to probably us the fan media mainstream media you know that will also i believe adapt further over over time you know it's fairly like that i'm going to be able to email liverpool whatever whatever i feel like and say can i have a player interview because that's just not that's just not the way it doesn't work in the men's game the women's game will go that way as well but that which is fine but Philip, we talked about it before, like the language used to describe the women's game. You know, I think as the game grows, it will probably go more, probably like the men's game in terms of it's tactical. It is a, it's fine to be critical of a player. You know, yeah. at the moment, it feels still a little bit like if, you, if you're critical of a player, it's kind of frowned upon. Which yeah. I think, it, I, I always think as long as it's constructive, not, you know, we know, we know the type of criticism, yeah. it's also that's not constructive, but, you know, as in, tactical questions or substitution questions. The things that we all talk about in football, I didn't agree with that sub, you know, I'm not sure why that player is playing in that position because I, I think they're better there, you know. But at the moment, it feels yeah. a bit like if you, if you have that conversation, it's a little bit frowned upon at the moment. Yeah, I mean, for me, it should be perfectly okay to say that you don't feel like a player is good enough or that, you know, we should be looking to do better than them, you know, next season. That, that, that shouldn't be frowned upon. Um, but at the moment, it is a little bit patronising, you know, the way that, you know, everything that you say has to be a positive or, you know, it has to be like patting somebody on the back or, and you know. It comes, you, from, it comes from a good place. It's it not, comes from a very good place, yeah, don't get me not, wrong. It's, it's not meant to be, but sometimes I, I sometimes find some of the languages can come across that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think some of it comes down to as well because, you know, because fans can speak to the players after the match and, um, you know, they kind of get to know them a little bit, it then mm. kind of, they feel it's, uncomfortable then to then join yeah, in yeah. with a criticism of that said player. Um, but, you know, if, if we want the, the game to improve, if we want players to improve, then, you know, I'm sure that Matt Beard isn't sitting there and, you know, basically never saying anything negative to a player. You know, that's how... That's how people grow. You know, I, I'm not perfect in my job. I get, you know, feedback constantly about, you know, my performance. And, you know, it should be the same, you know, no matter what anybody's doing. Um, you know, it can't all be roses and, you know, basically sugarcoating everything. You know, there has to be that analytical part of, of the game as well if we want to go that way. I think the issue is that there's, there's I think, far too much um, unpleasant and almost on the verge of bullying invective in the men's game 
and yeah. that verges into mainstream spaces, whether that's mainstream within sort of a fan media ish circle at times, or whether that's even all the way to the the web pages of a of a subscription based website, where I think there's been a couple of articles recently on the Athletic that have really, I think, targeted individual players in a in a quite unpleasant way. Um, I'm talking about Kaiter and, and Fernandez, and I want to be clear about this. I suspect that the journalists who were asked to write those pieces probably didn't even really want to write, want to write them. Hmm. Didn't, but they know that that sort of stuff will drive clicks, and it has the Tombra of social media bullying. One of the issues is that every now and again it appears within the women's game, some of the criticism very quickly accelerates. It goes from the idea of, I'm not sure about this player playing for Liverpool, to the tombra of absolute horror show territory. Yeah. And it appears that people, you know, it's a, it's a, it is a difficult-ish barometer, so I can understand why there is a defensiveness, because the feeling is if you take one step to the right, you might end up taking eight steps to the right, and we're in the space of hmm. compilation videos trying to embarrass footballers, which, for instance, the men's captain of the Liverpool team has had to put up with since 2016 so yeah. you've i think within that no one wants to see that or a, mm -hmm. the vast majority of people don't want to see that so it means that it feels really really almost you're trying to walk a path in terms of trying to say you're not sure about player x and their long-term future within liverpool i think a really important part of this is the the point that i was almost making before with the number of chelsea players and philip has said about the number of chelsea players that are getting liverpool's first 11. i think one of the things that's a pretty constant point is that just because a player may not suit liverpool at the moment or liverpool in a season's time doesn't mean that they couldn't be playing um, and having a role to play in a WSL side. I think if there's one thing you can mm. say about all of this Liverpool squad this season, uh, with the possible exception of 35-year-old Niamh Fahey, solely because she's 35 years old, you know, I feel as though almost every single one of them, and, and Rachel Finesse herself, who's now moved on and dropped down a division, I feel as though every... Has she dropped down a division? I think I'm right. Yes, yeah, yeah, she Bristol, has, yeah. yeah. Um, she's at Bristol, yeah. I feel as though every single one of them has demonstrated pretty much that they could play a squad role for a WSL championship side for the next couple of seasons. Now, we might not want that to be at Liverpool because we want Liverpool to move from a side who are going to be somewhere between 8th and 12th to a side that's going to be somewhere between 4th and 8th or maybe even a little bit better. But I think that, you know, I think that all the time, there's this desire to, for instance, say something like, and I'll use a men's team example again, and he's always a good one for this, Jordan Henderson's not good enough to play for the Champions League side, when there's this huge body of evidence of Jordan Henderson playing for the Champions League side <laughs> and for a side that finishes in the Champions League places. In the same way, you know, I'm trying to think of an example because I don't want it to seem like it's two on top now, but there might be some people, for instance, who might look at someone like Yana Daniels across the course of the season and feel like, I'm not quite sure she can function with a regular first team spot in this Liverpool side. But the one thing that she's shown, and I think shows yesterday, is firstly, an unbelievable attitude. Secondly, a lot of tactical nous. Thirdly, a fair bit of physicality. And fourthly, I really liked the performance against Leicester when she moved to de facto right back. Yes. Um, I and, and I think that, you know, there, I'm not saying for a second, I want Yana Daniels to start the rest of Liverpool's games this season alongside, um, you know, a, a, effectively alongside Stengel in attack. Similarly, I'm not saying I even necessarily feel as though she should start the rest of Liverpool's games this season or maybe even start any of them. But she's shown she's a really, really good professional who can play a role in a side that's at the level that Liverpool are currently at. And the reason why we can say that that's the case is because that's quite literally what's happened. And I think in yeah. time saying this, that's quite literally what's happened, but maybe next season we want to do something else is valid. And I think finding the language around that can be a little bit tricky for people, especially when everyone gets far too carried away with sort of performative nonsense across 280 characters or whatever. Uh, I think it's important to sort of take a bit of a deep breath in and out and also just always contextualise things with player X has shown the ability to be part of this can they be part of what we'd like? That might be a little bit trickier. But that firstly doesn't mean it's impossible with good coaching. But secondly, it doesn't mean that that person is a waste of time. Uh, yeah. And that's mm. that's that's where a lot of this language ends up. And I think it's really important not to go there. But you can yeah, do I everything think, else. Yeah, that's the fine line. Because unfortunately, the world we're in, it's it's the world extreme, doesn't it? You're one or the other. And that that's the kind of we want to avoid. Because it's not healthy. It's not helpful. But also, you don't have that in any other walk of life. <laughs> To be fair, yeah. in my job, I'm not brilliant or crap. I'm somewhere in the middle, generally. You know, that's <laughs> just the way it is. Just the way it is. Because it'd be a horrendous day of work. Which 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 part of the bronze am I on today? You know, I'm on the down today. It's the next day I'm up the up. You know, so I can you know. And I think there probably is a bit more caution around the women's game. Is it's probably more likely a female player will see what you've put on social media if it's yeah. horrible. And yeah, it, I'm not saying Mo Salah, I give an example, doesn't see what's on social media, but I very much doubt he's going to see a lot of it because a he probably also run his account for a start. But 
I think in the women's game, you are more likely to see what somebody's put, both positive and negative, and the way the world negatives tend to stick with you because that's just human nature. You can't help it. So, but it's getting the balance right without it seeing patronising. But again, it, again, it's a fine line to tread, which is, I think we're sort of weaved our way around that fairly well, to be <laughs> honest. So let's get back to Liverpool. So all being well, WSL, you know, we've took we took over West Ham Neil and we're all happy we're all we're all happy. But the obviously I agree with Neil's view, the ultimate aim is you want to see Liverpool lift the champions lift the Champions League. But what is the next step for this this squad? We are where do we think what do we think we need to add to it to next season to sort of get ready for the kick on? You know, tactically, personnel, it's probably uh, let's be honest, it's a bit of both. And what do we believe will happen medium to long term? You know, what, it's quite a big question, I feel. That's all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult one because um, part of what bugs me about the women's game is the short nature of uh, players' contracts. Yeah. Um, and we all know that every summer, basically, you know, there's that question mark as to whether or not contracts are going to get renewed or whether or not they're going to be let go. Last season, at the end of last season, um, there was a there was a very big question mark as to whether or not you put your trust in the players that got you back into the, the WSL again. Uh, we did that largely. Um, and I think now we've, we're going to have had a season where we've looked at all of those players and we can go, yeah, we can, you know, count on that player next season. For me, obviously, it should be a building block now. So it shouldn't be, yeah, we're happy with where we are. You know, we're going to be in this situation again next season. I don't care if you do what. So there has to be difficult decisions made. Um, and there will be, I'm pretty sure, some players leaving the club in the summer that, you know, will be difficult for some of the fans to accept because they've got grown attached to them. You know, they've seen mm. them, you know, put two, three, four seasons um together in the show and you know we'll be reluctant to see them go you know i was i was disappointed to see rachel furness leave for example yeah. um, because of what she's given the club but if we're being honest and we you know we want the club to to you know make that next step and like neil says you know go into the fourth to to eighth bracket to be competing with the likes of aston villa and everton and not not to be in that relegation battle next season. We need to be making more signings, you know, along the lines of Fukunagano, where, you know, you can clearly see that, you know, her quality is is better than, you know, pretty much everybody within that squad. Um, you know, you'd need to look at the back line for me. Um, you know, it is an aging back line. So you'd have to say, you know, we we need to bring in some younger talent in there to 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 freshen that up and, you know, to make sure that, you know, we're not going to be in a situation where people's legs have completely gone and, you know, you can't, you can't compete with these sides. Um, you know, there's plenty of players there though, that, you know, you, you can build the side around, you know, if we can keep hold of Fuka Nagano, you've got, like we said, Kerry Holland, she's another one that we really need to keep hold of and, you know, build a side around Missy Bo Kearns, who, you know, I know she's probably the most inconsistent out of those three, I would say, but, you can see that her talent's there. Um, you know, another player who, you know, for me, we should be hanging our hat on. Um, Taylor Hines, who, although she's had a bit of a difficult season for me this season, I thought she was excellent yesterday, by the way, mm. some of her incisive passing from the left-hand side. Um, you know, there's plenty of question marks there about what we're going to do with this squad, but I do think that we may see quite a bit of an overhaul this season, you know, in the summer. Um, I think there'll be quite a few players that, will maybe go from being starters to being, you know, backup players, uh, squad players. And I think that's fine. That's the development that you want to see within within the squad. Um but yeah, it's it I just I just hope that there isn't too much of a negative reaction to to the decisions that are made now because I think it's clear for all of us that, you know, we need to make that next step and not and not stick around where we are and be in this scrap every single season. I think the idea of, you know, looking at bringing in five aged between 23 and 26, um, keeping Cairns, Nagano, Holland, Keane, and presuming she comes back from the injury strong and Hines, suddenly gives you there, if you include Lundgaard as well, that suddenly gives you in their early early to mid-20s, that suddenly gives you pretty close to an 11. 
that you feel as though you can you can get behind. And then you're looking at, for instance, some combination of, and I'd, I'd keep the vast majority of these, Covisto, Campbell, Stengel, Bonner, Van der Sanden, especially if they can get a fit uh, to, to, to play a number of games, Matthews, Lawley and Laws. Uh, Laws to continue on, obviously, his first choice in goal, but the rest in there to play and play a number of games, but maybe not necessarily be the absolute nailed on spine all the time. I think mm-hmm. that gives you, you know, if you add if you add five in the twenty three to twenty six category, that puts you in into really nice shape. And then others who play the part this season, I don't think it's, you know, I think there's a couple of questions about, for instance, if you're not going to, in the same way that I feel about, for instance, Chelsea hoarding players. There's no point at the age that she is, Leanne Robe, continuing being a Liverpool player if Liverpool aren't going to play her. She ought yeah. to be playing for, I would argue, a WSL side, not 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 yeah. a side in the Championship. She ought to be getting regular football. Just to showcase a talent, you know, she's trained her entire life and devoted her life to this so far. She's got maybe three or four more seasons of being able to do it because time catches up with everyone. So she should go somewhere where she's going to feel as though she's going to get 18 league games over the course of a season because she showed yesterday against Tottenham she's more than able to contribute when the opportunity comes. Similarly within there as well, you know, I think uh, I think Rihanna Roberts is in a similar boat. I think it's never quite settled with Humphrey over the course of a time here. Yeah. She's just never quite fitted, unfortunately. And then in there as well, you know, you've got, you know, you've got maybe Yana Daniels and that's that's th- you know and given you know Neve as I said before we've mentioned Rachel Furness I don't think anyone expects Natasha Dowie to stay uh, beyond the sort of the end of this season could be proven wrong on that but I, I certainly don't that's still a fair few ended up moving out but if you mm. then bring five in and maybe have a look at the, the list of players aged between 28 and 31 as I said a minute ago then you, I think you're in a stronger place as long as you nail the five that come in between the ages of 23 and 26. You're in a stronger place, a place to look up, a place where, for instance, you've got, you know, I think one of the things that's helped Missy Bo is actually playing with Holland and with Nagano. I think it helps that they're on a certain wavelength. I think Stengel's ability to hold the ball up and bring people into the game helps. And then from there, there's maybe a couple where you you need them to to, to, to similarly step up playing with better players. But then from there, I don't think Liverpool are too far from being able to look to become a top half side. So I don't think it is, you know, I think if you're not careful, you can end up sort of sort of acting as though five in and effectively sort of five and a half out feels like it's massive. I think it's more the idea of the next five in, if they are successful, means that in 12 months' time we're having this conversation. That's maybe when you are, someone is saying, well, I'm not sure about whether or not we, for instance, give Gemma Bonner another year. I'm not sure about mm. whether or not this, but I'm sure if Gemma Bonner's listening to this, she's thinking, well, I've got other ideas, pal. Put more good <laughs> players in, put more good players into this team. Get, let us defend higher up the pitch. Put me in a back four some other time, by the way, when I think I can impress, especially playing next to players like, for instance, you know, Jazz Matthews. We can look after this and we can help mm. Liverpool do really well home and away against the put four or five weakest teams in the division, which gets you another attacking player on the pitch, which means we're more likely to win. That's what she may well be thinking and she may well be, be right to think so and I'd want her to think so so I think but I think that within that I think that that's your, your direction and to be fair to what they've done you know with Lundgaard uh you know with Nagano Kenny Holland's going back for a for a, a couple of seasons now you know Keenan in there as well that's been the sort of the direction of travel I think and so if it continues to be the direction of travel then I think a lot of this is quite organic and I don't think it's you know and from there you know listen the the key question becomes, and that's why it is a big deal between now and the end of the campaign, can they win an away game? You know, and if they can win one away game, can they therefore win two away games? And then going into next season, can they look at, with the big red pen of games we need to win, can there be away games in there as well? Because the aim is not eighth. The aim is fifth or the aim is fourth. And to do that, we need to win these away games that we've got circles around. But to do that, we need to have more good players. And to do that, we need, therefore, that the five replacements, six replacements for those good players are players who've been good enough to be part of a team on a very regular basis that comes eighth. And that's the way all this is going to operate. Yeah, don't worry if you try and sell Gemma Bonner, Olivia will be coming after you anyway, so don't worry about that. She's <laughs> she's, she's definitely not going. Um, the other thing, Philip, I suppose, is I think we'll probably see this more in the summer is... Tactically, I'd be intrigued to see what tweaks we do next year because I think our first game in the championship it was four three three, and then we thought I thought we ever played it again. We went we went to three four three and we stayed with that. I mean, to be fair, it was a title, so you know, <laughs> can't complain about it. But we do see it feels like he wants to go to a back four. Uh, I think he couldn't do it against Arsenal and a few other players because of injuries, but that seems to be the direction of travel. Uh, is whether is it whichever formation you want to talk about, it feels tactically that might be one way we're, we're, sw- we're trying to switch it up, maybe to get a bit more 
pace or physicality in the side. Like Neil suggested, if you have a more physical dominant centre mid, does that free up Fuka and Kerry a bit more? It takes a bit of pressure off them. I think, I mean, yesterday, for example, I think we ended up 5-3-2 or 3-5-2 when we had the ball. It was purely down to the fact that we only had two fit players who could play up front um, in Yana Daniels and Kate Stengel. I think we've already seen that his preferred option would be to have three forwards on the pitch. Um, So I I don't think he'll mess with that too much. It's just, and I think, I think he also realizes now um, if he didn't do before that, you know, having three in the middle really serves us a lot better than having two in there. Um, You know, there was times where Kerry Holland and and Missy Bo Kearns were that, you know, strung out, you know, it was so hard to deal with playing against any side in the WSL. Um, so I think the natural progression will always be to go to a four three three. Um it just depends on, you know, what that the makeup of that side is, you know, who who he decides that, you know, his four across the back should be and who his three up top should be, whether he wants to hang his hat again on on Van der Sand and if he feels that he can keep a fit, or whether or not he decides that he needs to to go out there and get somebody else. Um, I mean, one of the biggest things for me this season, and I think what what has kind of put us a little bit above everybody else who's in that relegation battle, is the quality of Katie Stengel. Mm. I think without her, we we would be right down there. Um, and I think you know you saw that again yesterday. You know, the, her quality, um, I think, is is putting us that like kind of level above. Um, and it's something that I expected to happen at, at Tottenham. To be fair, when they they signed Beth England, you know, I thought yeah. that she would, you know, give them that boost up top that would take them away from the rest of of, uh, of those at the bottom. Um, it hasn't quite happened for them yet, but whether or not it will do now, uh, now they're going to have a new manager in place uh, remains to be seen. But, you know, I think I think it's critical for me that that we keep Katie Stengel. Um, I think I think she's she's outstanding. Um, and We've it's about that. who who we get with her, uh, whether or not we can get Leanne Kearn and fit again and and up to the level that she was in the championship. Um, because, you know, we, we all saw how, how oh, important she was. she was to us last season and we just haven't seen it this season due to injury. So, fingers We've crossed. We sort of that's the villa this year, though, isn't it? You know, they signed Rachel Daly. I mean, they signed a few other good players as well, but Rachel Daly just makes them a completely different Yeah, absolutely. Outfit. I mean, the, the, that's all the it, quality. That's sometimes all it takes. Yeah, she's exactly. Good. Yeah, just to, just to get you know one or two players with that sort of quality into your side, um, you know, really can you know make the difference between you being down there or be being in you know the top half of the table. Um, and Rachel Daly, you know, to, to take her as well from play, basically playing as a fullback in in uh, the Euros in the summer for England and and basically play her up top and. You know, such a good player that can basically play anywhere across throughout the team for me. Um, mm. You know, in, if we can get those sorts of players in, I think you know we, it would stand us in really good stead next season. Yeah, I don't think it's you know again, it's not. I think this conversation really when I'm talking about it, this other the 23 to 26 bracket. You're looking at, I think one more, presuming you know Keenan comes back and Van der Sanden is able to. Uh, is able to get herself fit. I think you're looking at one more centre forwards who could also play out wide, uh, who could do a bit of both. So you can play three forwards and you can maybe have the interchange and stuff. But it means that you've got three you, you feel as though can contribute at number nine because of the physical sort of batter in that that you get up there. One one holds a midfielder of the, the highest quality we can get our hands on. One centre back to to add to the options there. You know, uh, a full back, arguably, probably a right back, um, who you feel as though you could you, you could very much commit to at right back in order to offer Covisto uh, the option to play in other areas and also a, a little bit of competition. And then you're looking at maybe one more talented forward player if you can get your hands on it. You know, and that's that's five. And if you think about all of that coming into this side, because then, for instance, you know, if you get yourself a good holding midfield at a really good one, then you're picking two from Kearns, Holland and Nagano um, as a starting point 
in the in the heart of that midfield before you, for instance, have a conversation about Lundegaard or one or two others who are knocking around the squad still. You know, I think if you if you, for instance, have backup for Covisto, she, she doesn't feel like she's got to absolutely run herself into the ground for every minute. I think with Hines and Campbell in there, you've got left back options. I think one more centre back means you're picking two out of um, you know out of Matthews, Bonner, and and, and one more centre back, and then you've got Meg Campbell if you want to do that, and you can go to a three uh, from time to time. You know, all of this without it feeling like it's an overwhelming number of players. All of this just sort of puts you in in in. You know, in, in in better stead, and simultaneously, you know, you might get more out of the the players who are already there. So I don't think it's I don't think it's an enormous body of work. I really don't. I just think it's sensible stuff where you'll find that suddenly, you know, in, in being able to to let Fukunagano some games play the six and some games play ahead of someone at six, you, you're able to just able to manage that footballer better and get and get what you need out of a game by game, and not the idea you got your footballers firefighting. Yeah. yeah. Well, before we go then. Philippa, next game, Derby. At yeah, I mean, every time Neil keeps saying we need, you know, he'd like us to win an away game, I keep thinking that Derby. That'd be, that'd be the one, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if we could win there, um, I mean, it, it really does mean that you know you're out out of that relegation scrap for me, um, and it would be really good to kind of get a little bit of. Uh, I don't like to use the word revenge, but like a, a little bit of you know it back for for what happened at Anfield. Um, let's let, let's let's be right. We we were taught a bit of a lesson at Anfield, weren't we? They handled yeah, the pressure I, better than we did. To be fair, yeah. To them. I I mean, the more that I've watched this season, there's basically been two games where I've been really really disappointed with our performance. Uh, one was at Anfield, and the other one was when we played Man United away. And yeah. for me, I I can only you know think that it's to do with the pressure of those games, you know, playing at Anfield against Everton, they just handled it an awful lot better than what we did. Um, you know, I, I don't honestly believe there's a huge amount between the two sides. Um, I do think Everton are just, a, you know, more settled in the WSL, but I don't think when you look throughout their team, you don't go, you know, they're frightening. Um, I just think it got too much for us on the day. Um, and then Man United, you know, we're top of the league and it was our first game back. So maybe that played a little part in it as well. But, you know, I, I really, really would like us to, to at least not, you know, put a bit of a show on, um, I, you know, show what we can actually do rather than what we saw at Anfield, which was basically us get taught as lesson, as you say. Hmm. Neil, look forward to it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a tough game, but I think it's one that Liverpool can get something out of. I think Everton has, uh, Ever so slightly overperforming the, the the underlying numbers over the course of the campaign. I mean, you can say form and underlying numbers go out of the window in a derby, but I'm um, I'm of the view that this is a side which, you know, I think they, were, they have hard lines. Uh, looking at the highlights, the game against Leicester, uh, they have hard lines not to have, not to have got a win in that one. Um, but you know, towards the end of the match, our match against Leicester, we end up being able to say that we've had hard lines as that that one's wore on. Um, so you know, I think I think having a a sense that this is this is a game that we can get something out of. I think there is an element of, to use the old Jürgen Klopp line, I think we do need to maybe do a little bit of dragging them down to our level first and then killing them. Uh, I'm fine <laughs> with I'm fine with that. I think that that you know that's a valid way a valid way to play, and I think we might need to do a little bit of that. But I do think that you know in terms of being able to move the ball quickly, um, having having Fuka and 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 Kerry in there will help us with that in a way in which I think that in the the game at Anfield, I think that they, when they were able to find a gear, um, we sort of weren't quite sure where that gear was. I think we've got, maybe got a slightly better sense of it now. Uh, and that also includes what we're able to, to line up with at the heart of the defence as well, especially with a bit of luck in there. Um, I think a draw is a fine result, don't get me wrong. Uh, yeah. And I think part of how you win the game is by accepting that a draw is a fine result. But I do think that there is the possibility of there being something in it for Liverpool. Um, I also feel, if you want to talk about that away game, you know, there's both West Ham and Leicester to come to. And yeah. so I think this isn't just one here to maybe it's a bit of a fact finding mission, this one, in terms of what can work for us to win that one away game. A draw would be absolutely fine from a Liverpool point of view, but the idea of getting all three would be very sweet. Awesome. Uh, before we go, um, you guys have seen it have known LCA Drippers. Uh, our charity sponsor this year is Breast Cancer Awareness. So uh, we've got 12, 12 women, women are going to run the uh, Dublin Marathon. So we are trying to help them raise 20,000, I believe up to three and a half at the moment. So Links in the description below. If you can give, please give. We know times are tough. If you can't, please just share the link around. 
WhatsApp groups, work groups. Look, you never know who, who it reaches and you just might find that right person. So keep an eye on that. But listen, uh, Neil, Philippa, thank you very much for joining me again. Always a pleasure to talk to you too. And listen, we've been LC Day Trippers. We'll be back very, very soon. Thank you.